Good afternoon. We uh, now want to welcome our second panel of witnesses. First, uh, David, uh, Mr. David Botsko is the Inspector General of the Arizona Health Care Cost Containment System. Uh, Ms. Jean McQuarrie, is that close? Is Vice President for Client Services at Thomson Reuters. And Mr. Michael Cannon is Director of Health Policy Studies at the Cato Institute. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in. So I am going to ask you to please uh, rise and raise your right hands. I am sorry. We got another witness. Uh, Ms. Klein, I can see your last name, but uh, I don't have my uh, information. So when I get it, I will do uh, due diligence in your introduction, too, okay? Uh, but we can still take the oath. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect all witnesses answered in the affirmative. All right. I am going to start with Mr. Botsko, and we will um, move from my left to right. And you will have five minutes. I think you, if you were here for the first panel, you know their lights and what the lights mean. And Ms. Klein, by the time we get to you, I will have a, a full introduction worthy of your distinguished background, okay? We will start with Mr. Botsko. Good afternoon, Chairman Gotti, Ranking Member Davis, and the other distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the invitation to speak before this committee. I am David Botsko, the Inspector General of the Arizona Health Care Cost Containment System, the State Medicaid Agency. I have spent my entire career enforcing laws and protecting citizens. Prior to my 11 years with Medicaid, I was a special agent with the United States Government for 22 years conducting criminal investigations. The program I work for, ACCESS, was established in October 1982 as a managed care agency and as a leader in controlling medical costs within the Medicaid program. The $10 billion ACCESS budget serves 1.3 million beneficiaries. The ACCESS OIG was created in November 2009, replacing the Program Integrity Office. As of February 2011, the OIG has recognized a total savings and cost avoidance of approximately $31 million during the past eight months alone. We also have achieved nine criminal convictions with 11 additional individuals pending prosecution as I speak. Even though overall staffing for the ACCESS program is down due to budget challenges, we have actually increased OIG staffing. My testimony will focus on three elements that impact the success or failure of Medicaid investigations, and I have some recommended solutions. The OIG utilizes a dedica dedicated team of investigators to screen Medicaid applications that meet suspected fraud criteria. The applications are referred to the Fraud Prevention Unit, which strives to conduct the initial investigation within 24 hours of receipt. During the State fiscal year 2010, the unit received almost 8,200 referrals, and we conducted approximately 8,000 investigations. The investigations resulted in 1,500 ineligible individuals being denied benefits. The estimated cost avoidance for these denials was in excess of $15 million. During this time frame, the Fraud Prevention Unit saved an average of $1.9 million per investigator per year. We are working to expand this program to more offices, but the State is limited to available matching funds for additional staffing. The OIG has two units for investigating member and provider compliance issues in addition to the Fraud Prevention Unit. The average cost per investigator is $58,000 per year per investigator. In 2010, these two units opened 450 investigations and closed 300 cases. During the State fiscal year 2010, these two units realized a total cost avoidance and recovery of $13 million with a return on investment of 9.1. We are utilizing an analytical tool produced by EDI Watch to discover suspicious payment patterns and apply this information to other providers within the system. These tools generate additional information in potential cases that also require more State match for fu funds for investigations. We have developed a successful outreach program that has dramatically increased the amount of fraud referrals received by our office. However, because of our success, we have created more backlogs. 
Other issues that impact our resources, such as countless staff hours working with federally mandated audit contractors, which have historically had little positive impact while draining resources. Recently imposed Affordable Care Act rules mandate additional screening requirements and accountability for receiving provider application fees, et cetera. These mandates will have had and will continue to impact the agency resources as they continue to strain our overburdened workforce. The ongoing efforts at the Federal and State level to reduce fraud and waste in health care programs, programs is critically important. We are confident that we can continue to improve our oversight by focusing responsibilities and resources on those who are best equipped and most informed, which is the States. Each State Medicaid program is unique. In Arizona, we rely significantly on managed care, and we work with our managed care partners. But as, a, as the State, we play a critical role in investigating and pursuing fraud. The State Medicaid fraud control units are, are funded with 75 percent Federal matching dollars. Why not fund the State Medicaid OIGs and program integrity units with the same funding, but require that the State document the rate of return on that investment to the Congress? Change the Federal Code to allow the State OIGs or program integrity units to conduct full investigations and avoid duplication of effort and save valuable time and money. To summarize, the State Medicaid programs are best positioned to target limited resources. We also use a program called CLEAR in investigating our, our members. My recommendation is to increase matching dollars that should not require additional Federal expenditures if duplicate Federal initiatives were streamlined and focused on State efforts. Medicaid is a Federal-State partnership. The States are doing everything in their power to ensure the Medicaid program that we are responsible for operates efficiently. Thank you, and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, sir. Uh, we will now recognize Ms. McQuarrie for her uh, five-minute statement. Chairman Gowdy, Ranking Member Davis, members of the subcommittee, my name is Jean McQuarrie, and I am Vice President for Health Care Payment Integrity for Thomson Reuters. Thomson Reuters has been engaged with our public and private sector customers to ensure payment integrity for decades. The U.S. health care system is complex, with providers treating differently for the same condition. Data mining alone is not sufficient to validate the reasonableness of services being billed. Clinical intelligence must be embedded in analytic software to allow for identification of inappropriate bills. Additionally, most fraud investigators are not physicians or professional coders. Therefore, it takes software to accommodate the complexities of health care for the fraud investigator. The foundation of clinically based fraud, waste, and abuse detection systems are essential. Within the Thomson Reuters Advantage Suite product, we include episodes of care, which aggregate inpatient, outpatient, and drug claims into disease categories with severity stages. Episode grouping enables validating submitted claims against patients' medical conditions, identifying services that might be fraudulent or abusive. Clinical intelligence is also added to the data. These clinically intense data additions save our customers hundreds and thousands of investigative hours each month by allowing rapid and clinically accurate data mining. Congress has recognized the critical importance of predictive modeling in the fight against fraud and waste and now needs to recognize the critical, the critical importance of clinically intensive models to further advance the analytics essential to fraud, waste, and abuse. As an example, it is a well-known fact that some types of fraud are pervasive, and they occur because it is hard to catch them in claims data. Your screen will have some screenshots from this system. Having a clinically-based detection system is essential to identify the issues. For example, diabetic test strips aren't needed by patients without diabetes. We use our episode technology to identify patients who get test strips and then make sure that they have diabetes. The subset selection process allows me to run these reports in English without having to understand the complex coding behind disease conditions. The report shows individual pharmacies and the number of diabetic test strips that they distribute to patients who do not have diabetes with some of these pharmacies in the 95 to 99 percent range. This could be an indication that beneficiaries are purchasing these items which are frequently sold at flea markets or that pharmacies are billing for products that aren't delivered. 
In Medicaid, the payment integrity units run complex statistical analyses for specific provider types like mental health, dentistry, and therapy. These complex reports rank providers by their degree of deviation from their peer groups based on numerous statistical measures calculated over time. The comparisons to the peer group are automatically adjusted for the severity of illness of the patients so that rankings of the providers are fair for those providers who treat really sick patients. Good providers greatly appreciate clinical intelligence. It would take an investigator hundreds of hours to perform dynamic risk-adjusted profiling capabilities all embedded in our, the Thomson Reuters Advantage Suite product. With our clinically-based solution, these complex measures can be adjusted by our clients with just a few mouse clicks. To investigate the providers who rank at the top of the report, we also go to CLEAR, the Thomson Reuters Public Records Data Access Solution. It is important to use public records and other disparate data when we look for fraud and abuse. Investigators should not use claims data alone. Public records data sets include Federal and State sanctions from all States, as an example. This data can be queried automatically and is available as a standalone searchable platform. This screen shows how easy it is to request a review of one of the ranked providers. And when we drill down, we can see this provider has four sanctions and leads us to a link analysis charts showing two providers related to 19 total providers on boards of directors of each other's companies who practice out of the strip mall you see in front of you, which does not seem to support the millions of dollars billed to Medicare by these providers. Our Thomson Reuters clients who use the, this analytic software include 22 State Medicaid agencies who identify hundreds of millions of dollars in fraud, waste and abuse annually. In addition, CMS has Advantage Suite implemented and is rolling it out now. In closing, as documented in the white papers you will find on the table to my right, the problem of fraud, waste and abuse in health care, as clearly noted today, is huge. We have done a lot to help our clients combat the problem. CMS has taken many steps to implement predictive modeling and now clinically based detection systems. That said, there is still much to do. Thomson Reuters won't let up. We will continue to work hard and fast to deploy the best technologies and subject matter experts to say, stay ahead of those who would defraud the government. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cannon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Davis, for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Davis, for this opportunity to address the Committee on this very important issue. My name is Michael Cannon. I am the Director of Health Policy Studies at the Cato Institute. The Cato Institute is a libertarian think tank founded in 1977 to promote the ideas of individual liberty, limited government, free markets and peace. The best evidence that we have suggests that one out of every three dollars that Medicare spends is pure waste. That is, it provides zero benefit to Medicare enrollees, either in terms of improved health or greater patient satisfaction. Fraud and improper payments exceed, likely exceed 9 percent of Medicare spending and have been uh, estimated to be as high as 40 percent in the New York State Medicaid program. Medicaid abuse is so great that entire cottage industries of consultants and lawyers have emerged to help individuals and states abuse the program. It is difficult to convey the magnitude of waste, fraud and abuse in Medicare and Medicaid. We often hear about how it, private insurance companies earn excessive profits. Well, insurance company profits on an annual basis come to about 12 or 13 billion dollars a year. Improper payments in Medicare, including fraud, have been clocked at 48 billion dollars per year. So for every one dollar the private insurance companies earn in profits, Medicare loses four dollars to fraud and other improper payments. When we include Medicaid, the Federal Government loses nearly six dollars to fraud and improper payments for every one dollar that insurance companies earn in profits. We often hear about how there is too much money in political campaigns. Well, if you look at all Federal campaigns and you look at spending by all candidates, all parties, all independent groups seeking to influence Federal elections in both 2007 and 2008, the sum total of all that spending comes to just over $5 billion. Medicare loses uh, roughly 25 times that amount each year to waste, uh, wasteful health care spending, that is, health care spending that does nothing to improve the health or uh, improve patient satisfaction for Medicare enrollees. 
Medicare fraud is not confined to the behavior of, behavior of criminals and a few health care providers. Uh, elected and unelected officials in both the legislative and executive branches of the Federal Government routinely defraud the American public by, by pretending that the so-called Medicare trust funds contain actual assets that may be used to pay Medicare benefits. As the Clinton administration explained in its 2000 budget submission, the balances in the Medicare and Social Security trust funds, quote, do not consist of real economic assets that can be drawn down in the future to fund benefits. The existence of large trust fund balances, therefore, does not by itself have any impact on the government's ability to pay benefits." End quote. I should note that was an aberration that appeared in one uh, of the Clinton administration's budgets, and I don't know that any statement that frank has appeared in any budget submission since. Congress and the White House, under the control of both parties, have also defrauded the American people by using budgetary gimmicks to hide the full cost of Medicare. These fraudulent gimmicks include the legislated reductions in Medicare payments to physicians under the Balanced Budget Act of 1997, passed under Republican control of Congress, and to Part A providers under the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010, passed under a democratically controlled Congress. Such spending reductions are so politically implausible that Congress routinely rescinds them, yet their inclusion in statute makes Medicare appear less costly than it, would, than it actually will prove to be in a 10-year budget window and beyond. This type of fraud has become so routine that the Congressional Budget Office attempts to correct for it by projecting future Medicare outlays based on current policy, assuming that Congress rescinds the spending reductions as opposed to current law, which assumes the reductions will take effect. I think this hearing is particularly timely given the budget blueprint that House Budget Committee Chairman Paul Ryan has introduced today. The Medicare and Medicaid reforms in that proposal could dramatically reduce waste, fraud and abuse in those programs, and I think that expanding those proposals would do even more to combat waste, fraud and abuse. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Rachel Klein is the Deputy Director for Health Policy at Families USA. Welcome, Ms. Klein. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me here today to speak to you about the important role that Medicaid plays in our nation's health care system. Um, as you mentioned, I am Deputy Director of Health Policy at Families USA, the national organization for health care consumers. The Medicaid program has become the backbone of our system of health care for seniors, people with disabilities, and children. In 2010, the program covered 68 million people nationwide. In, starting in 2014, Medicaid will become the platform for an important expansion of health coverage for low-income working adults filling an unfortunate hole in our safety net. Medicaid was designed as a partnership between the Federal Government and States, and States have a lot of flexibility in that partnership. The Federal Government provides on average 57 percent of the cost of the program and establishes some minimum requirements regarding who is eligible and what is covered. The States administer the program and make choices about whether to expand beyond the minimum requirements from eligibility and coverage, how to structure the delivery of health care and pay providers. States have taken advantage of their flexibility to design very different programs. Eligibility levels vary widely across States. Who is covered varies widely. What services are covered, as well as delivery systems, all vary widely. Today, Representative Paul Ryan, Chairman of the House Budget Committee, released a budget proposal that suggests radical changes to the Medicaid program that will severely restrict State flexibility. The proposal would reduce Federal Medicaid funding by 35 percent, more than one-third over the next 10 years. It would eliminate the Medicaid expansion authorized by the Affordable Care Act enacted last year, and it would end the current Federal commitment to sharing Medicaid health care costs with States by capping Federal Medicaid funding. States are already struggling with Medicaid costs in a difficult economic climate. The Federal Medicaid cuts proposed by Chairman Ryan today will not help States with the difficult budget choices before them. Rather, they will compound the difficulties facing States by shifting more costs to them. States would be forced to cut eligibility, benefits and provider payment rates or raise taxes significantly, thus shifting costs to working families. This proposal does nothing to contain or reduce health care costs. It just shifts the burden. The proposal will make it very difficult for States to meet the needs of their residents when demand for Medicaid increases sharply, such as during a recession, a hurricane, or an epidemic. States are already operating very lean Medicaid programs, and there are not a lot of places left for them to cut. In fact, uh, Medicaid costs 27 percent less than private insurance for children and 20 percent less than private insurance for adults, according to the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. These cuts will leave governors. 
uh, as a letter from 17 Democratic governors released yesterday attests, little choice but to eliminate health coverage for many vulnerable people. When the Federal Government cuts Medicaid, it is important to know these cuts will particularly hurt America's senior citizens and people with disabilities. Medicaid is the largest payer of nursing home care, allowing seniors to receive the intensive care they need as they grow more frail and aren't able to live at home. It is also the largest payer of home and community-based services, allowing seniors to live in their homes or with their families longer before they need to enter a nursing home. Altogether, Medicaid pays for nearly half of all long-term care received in the U.S. These services are critically important not only for seniors, but for the estimated 52 million family caregivers who are able to continue working or get respite when they need it because of these services. Medicaid also makes Medicare work, helping seniors who have low incomes pay their Medicare premiums and copayments. Medicaid is also an engine for State economies. Federal funding provided to States generates jobs and business activity that wouldn't otherwise be in those State economies. For example, every $1 million of additional Federal Medicaid funding in South Carolina supports 24 jobs and $2.2 million in business activity in a year. In Illinois, $1 million of Federal funding spent on Medicaid generates 22 jobs and $2.5 million in business activity in a year. Likewise, a reduction in Federal spending on Medicaid would cost jobs, wages and business activity. Moreover, Medicaid helps working families when they lose their jobs in a recession. Despite high unemployment rates, there was no increase in the number or rate of uninsured children in 2009 during the height of the recession. Between 2008 and 2009, Medicaid enrollment increased significantly as families were able to rely on Medicaid when they lost their job-based health insurance. A proposal such as that offered by Chairman Ryan would seriously undermine this Nation's and State's ability to meet the health care needs of our most vulnerable citizens. Seniors, people with disabilities and children will suffer and State economies will be strained. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for this opportunity to speak here today. Thank you. At this point, we would, I would uh, call on the distinguished uh, gentleman from uh, Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Medicaid is a vital program that serves the most vulnerable Americans in this country. I often have said that it was the best thing that happened to health care since Indians discovered cornflakes. But the vast majority of these individuals are either young children, senior citizens, or individuals with disabilities who rely on the services that Medicaid provides. In February, Mississippi Governor Haley Barber told a joke about Medicaid beneficiaries driving fancy cars to get their prescription drugs while attending a National Governors Association meeting. Governor Barber told The Washington Post, and I am quoting, We have people pull up at the pharmacy window in a BMW, and they say that they can't afford their co-payment, end of quote. On March the 2nd, the Washington Post's fact checker gave Governor Barber's story four Pinocchios, meaning that it was a well of a story and it was inaccurate. Uh, Ms. Klein, let me ask you, in your extensive analysis of Medicaid programs, do you think that the Governor's assertion is an accurate depiction of people who, who are seeking services through Medicaid? No, I don't. Um, there are many, many millions of vulnerable people in the United States who rely on Medicaid because they cannot afford to get health care anywhere else. Health care is extremely expensive. And when people have very low-paying jobs, they really rely on Medicaid to make sure that their kids can go to the doctor when they have an ear infection or that their parents can afford the home care and nursing care services that they need. I am old enough to remember when there was no Medicaid. <laughs> I mean, and I recall individuals who actually had no access to care at all. I mean, there was simply nothing that they could do. I mean, they used home remedies. They did whatever they could come up with. What do you think would happen to these individuals today if there was no Medicaid? I mean, what, what would they be able to do? 
Without Medicaid, people will be uninsured. Um, health insurance is very expensive, and most of the people who rely on Medicaid for their primary form of health coverage cannot afford to purchase health care on the private market, so they would go uninsured. Um, they would miss out on a lot of health care. As we know, people who are uninsured do not get as much health care even when it is needed as people um, who have Medicaid coverage, and so we would see a lot of unmet needs going on, and they would delay care until they ended up in the emergency room. So if they are uninsured, unemployed, overtaxed emergency rooms, places where emergency rooms may come like an old man's teeth, few and far apart, they are in serious trouble. I, I, I mean, the ultimate has to be that the only individuals who could benefit from this kind of system would be undertakers and cemeteries, because there would be no way for these individuals to receive just a modicum of care. And so I, it, it would be a terrible way to run a health care system. And, and I certainly would hope that our look at waste, fraud, and abuse is not taking us in that direction, although we know that there are in, in individuals who exploit systems in both the public and private sector. And, Ms. McQuarrie, I would like to just ask you, how does your organization work with providers in both of those elements to try and get rid of waste, fraud, and abuse? Thank you for your question. In both of those elements, you mean in Medicare and in Medicaid? Yes. Yes. Um, we provide um, information, independent data, data mining to our customers. As I mentioned, we have 22 State Medicaid agencies who use our data to help identify cases of fraud, waste, and abuse in their programs. We support CMS and its initiatives as well. Thank you, you very much. Please go right ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. The important point that I was making earlier is that the, the software has to be smarter. You, we just can't aggregate numbers and crunch data and say we are spending too much money on a particular program. We have to look at it from a clinical perspective. So we have physicians and clinicians who help validate the clinical intensity that we build into this data mining software. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am going to have to run out, but I am not abandoned. No, I, I do not feel abandoned. I, I feel. Cummins is going to be here. I, I, I just got to go and protect my redistricting process. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Chair will recognize the uh, gentleman from Arizona, Dr. Gozar. Thank you. Ms. Klein, why do we have so many emergency visits? Um, why are we stacked up in the emergency room? I'm sorry? Why are we all stacked up in the emergency room? I mean, you, you know the facts and figures. Um, well, I, there are lots of people who use emergency rooms for a lot of different reasons. Many there's of them a, have a, actually emergencies. Oh, yes. That's but I mean, but we're seeing an undo thing. And, uh, and, and let's kind of go to statistics. We can make statistics do anything we want them to. Okay? Wouldn't you say the number one reason we have a, a problem in our emergency room is that we're lacking family docs? You know, actually, I, I do not know, because I am, I am not an expert in sort of how the health care system is divvied up. I know there are certainly shortages of providers in certain areas of the country. That is true in, across the um, health care sector. It is pretty much. But the number one reason why we don't have family docs is because of unfunded mandates. Is that true, Mr. Botsko? Thank you for the question. Uh, regarding whether that is the reason, I am not really at liberty to say that is not my specialty. Mm -hmm. But one of the unfunded mandates is, is that we are asking providers to do more and more with less, and they are not actually seeing patients. And so the only recourse patients have is to go to the emergency room. And, and yes, sir, we certainly are being asked to do a lot more with a lot less. Can you tell me some of the strings that are attached with the Federal money for, for Medicaid money? 
Some of the ones that we are seeing are the unfunded mandates where we are asked to uh, go out and do uh, site visits, and we have received no additional funding for that. We are also asked to account for the money that is to be collected uh, for providers to register under the new Act, which I believe this year is about $505. So we have to collect it, account for it, and uh, be able to do our due diligence uh, in counting for the public's money. Now, I know I have talked with the Governor from Arizona, being from Arizona. Um, we got some, some, some difficult circumstances. How would you see that, could you see us working more collaboratively or, or more, um, how do I say, uh, from a State's vantage point versus what the Federal Government is dictating? I believe that the, the States are probably the best resource that we have right now in combating fraud, waste and mismanagement. And as in my testimony, I spent 22 years with the Federal Government as a Federal agent and a supervisory special agent, and 11 years currently with the uh, State Medicaid program. We are the best equipped to fight the fraud because we are closest to it. We know what is going on in our States. We work collaboratively with our health care programs. We work with the managed care system. And I believe that uh, increasing the uh, Federal match, such as right now the Medicaid prosecutors receive 75 percent and we, the OIG, receive 50 percent. And I believe matching that and making it at least equal with the prosecutor would be a uh, wise solution to the program. So one size fits all doesn't work? Not really. So we are really too big um, yeah, as a Federal program. Should we go back to the States? That is my belief. Hmm. Uh, Mr. Cannon, you know, one of the aspects of, uh, you know, uh, of medicine is defensive medicine. Can you talk to me a little bit about tort reform and how we can look at tort reform as the overall cost and why we haven't had any tort reform, um, particularly last year and, and years before? There is a lot of belief that defensive medicine is driving wasteful health care spending. There is some evidence to suggest that it is, but I think it is important to recognize that there are two types of defensive medicine. One is efficient defensive medicine, so that if the uh, let's, let's take the example of back pain. Should everyone with, uh, with back pain receive an MRI as a matter of course? Well, if it turns out that not giving those patients an MRI results in injuries to them, they suffer losses because we didn't de detect serious spinal injuries, that, uh, that would exceed the cost of providing those MRIs. Well, then, yes, we should provide those MRIs. That is efficient defensive medicine. So uh, there is also inefficient defensive medicine where the cost of not providing them uh, those MRIs is not that great, maybe because we don't have many good treatments uh, for, for back pain, in which case the cost of providing the MRIs would exceed the, uh, you know, whatever losses they would suffer from not, having, from not receiving them. So it is very difficult, first of all, to tease out the inefficient stuff from the efficient defensive medicine. Um, and it, important to distinguish between the two, but it is also difficult to, uh, to discern whether it is uh, the fear of lawsuits that is driving uh, the use of more and more services, or is it the fact that in this country, as a result of mostly Federal policy, most doctors are paid on a fee-for-service basis where they make more money the more, uh, the more services they provide. Both the fear of lawsuits and fee-for-service payment are pushing in the same direction. So I am not sure that um, it was, first of all, very difficult to figure out how much defensive medicine is contributing, inefficient defensive medicine is contributing to wasteful health care spending. Um, but I believe that it is not a significant factor. I think that things, that the fact that the Federal Government su subsidizes health care uh, so much through the Medicare and Medicaid programs and the tax code uh, plays a much larger role. Now, why have I, that said, I think that we do need serious medical malpractice liability reform in this country. Why have we not seen it? I think the biggest reason is that uh, judges do, will not enforce contracts that allow individuals, either with their health care providers or uh, through an insurance plan as an intermediary, to set their own, to decide, uh, um, uh, basically to pick their own medical malpractice liability reforms. Judges won't enforce those contracts. Um, I think that is a much superior approach to uh, trying out things like caps, loser pay rules and so forth, because if something doesn't work, it is much easier for patients to rewrite the contracts than it is for the Federal Government or State governments to rewrite the laws once they have been put into place. Hold that thought. We will come back for a second round. 
At this point, I will uh, recognize the distinguished gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. The, um, you know, this morning, uh, the Budget Committee Chairman Ryan uh, unveiled his budget for fiscal year 2012, which calls for repealing the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, turning Medicaid into a block grant and forcing Medicare beneficiaries to spend more of their fixed income on purchasing private health insurance. Uh, now, in my district, if I go to a um, town hall meeting and there are 100 people and I ask them what is their source of income, do they have more than one source, usually 90 percent, sometimes 95 percent tell me all they have is a Social Security check. According to the Wall Street Journal article uh, Monday, Chairman Ryan's proposal would, and this is what the Wall Street Journal said, would essentially end Medicare as a program that directly pays uh, those bills. Instead, seniors would be forced to venture out into the private insurance marketplace to purchase insurance. The Wall Street Journal mentioned giving insurance companies approximately $15,000 towards the beneficiary's purchase of private health insurance, leaving beneficiaries to pay the remainder out of pocket. And since uh, my Republican friends also want to repeal the Affordable Care Act, seniors are not going to have any of its protections against abuses by private insurance, uh, by the private health insurance industry, such as prohibiting pre existing condition exclusions and charging sicker beneficiaries uh, higher prices than younger, healthy people. I am trying to figure out, I, I, and I haven't, we just got the proposal today. Ms. Klein, help me with this. Who is going to hire uh, to, to ensure a, a, an elderly person? I, I'm just curious. You know, they, I can't see how fifteen thousand dollars is going to do that. Who's going to? Who's going? I, I, I mean, I, I have people that I know who are forty years old and can't get insurance because of a preexisting condition. So now you are going to put all these seniors out, not you, but the proposal to put the seniors out there and give them a little piece of paper with $15,000, one visit in one day or maybe at best a day and a half will take care of that $15,000 quick. And we have a lot of seniors with chronic conditions. I mean, have you, have you gone through that? I mean, have you figured that out? No, I haven't figured that out. Thank you very much for the question. Um, I think it's really important to take a very close look at this proposal, which is essentially um, removing the promise and guarantee of access to affordable health coverage that we have made to America's seniors as well as other vulnerable people. The Medicare program and the Medicaid program work together to ensure that seniors, people with disabilities, as well as children and working families have access to affordable health coverage that is comprehensive and that meets their needs. Without those programs, we will see a lot of people who are unable to get necessary health care. I remember I was talking to my mother uh, a, few, uh, a few weeks ago, and she uh, came up in South Carolina, rural South Carolina, and she was telling me, we were talking about my grandparents who died long before I was born. And they died in their 40s. And I said, Mother, that's, that's kind of young to die. She said, Well, back then, there was no, we expected to die that early. Can you see us going back to that kind of situation? And I don't, I don't like to, to, to just, just throw death out there, but the question becomes what are the alternatives? Um, and it just seems to me that people, Say, for example, we didn't have Social Security, we would have seniors literally either having to depend on their relatives or begging for money. And it seems like in a country as great as ours, we can do better than that. And I think, you know, a lot of people have said to me, well, Republicans aren't going to go through with that. And I said, well, it's out there. And I think we've got to be very, very careful with that. Would you agree? I would. Thank you. And does anybody else have any comments on this? Yes, sir. Mr. Cannon. Thank you for the opportunity, Congressman. Um, I think that uh, 
Lots of all seniors under the Chairman's proposal, as I understand it, will be able to obtain health insurance coverage. And that's the, that is because the payment they receive from the Federal Government to purchase that coverage will be adjusted for income, so that lower income people will get larger vouchers, if you will. He doesn't call them that. I will use the V word. Um, and they will also be risk adjusted, so that people with Ill, uh, severe illnesses will get larger vouchers and uh, be able to purchase insurance coverage. That will cover a lot of people uh, who have preexisting conditions. And another um, uh, Which is probably about all of them, by the way. Well, that is true. And that is why the average voucher amount, $15,000, would be more than the average amount to cover, that it would cost to cover someone under age 65. And if you are concerned about that not being enough money, remember the Dartmouth Atlas of Health Care has shown pretty uh, convincingly that one-third of all Medicare spending is pure waste, does nothing to improve the health of Medicare patients. Think of that as a huge margin of safety, so that seniors, even if they consume one-third less care than they do today under today's very inefficient Medicare program, it would not harm their health. I see my time is running out. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Um, Ms. Klein, do you disagree that we are $14 trillion in debt? I am actually not an expert on the Federal budget. Well, you were just very critical of, of, of our colleague Paul Ryan's budget. So do you disagree that we are $14 trillion in debt? No, I do not. Do you disagree that the annual deficit is $1.5 trillion? No, I do not. Do you disagree with the President when he says there is $900 billion in waste, fraud and abuse in Medicare and Medicaid? I'm, I'm, no, I don't. Have you proposed a budget for 2012? No, sir. Has your organization proposed a budget for 2012? No. Well, I, I'm struck with your, your, your willingness to criticize Representative Ryan when you have no alternative yourself. By 2031, every single cent in revenue generated by this, the most powerful economy on the face of the earth, will only be sufficient for the entitlements. That is it, by 2031. So what is your plan to reform Medicare and Medicaid? I think we need to remember that these programs provide vital services to people who, without them, would be left without access to care. And you don't think we know that? You, you, you don't think Representative Ryan knows that? I wouldn't want to conjecture about what Representative Ryan knows. Um, I think it is important to remember whenever we are looking at proposals to reform these programs, the vital role that they play in protecting people's access to health care who would otherwise go without. Well, you would agree with me. Is, is the government the only way indigent folks can have access, access to health care? Is that the only model we have ever pursued in this country? I don't believe it is the only model that we have ever pursued, but it has been a very successful model over the past 40-plus years. And I know that there are many folks, even within the health insurance industry, who agree that the existing programs that we have um, are the right way to go, particularly for people who have very high medical costs, as seniors and very low-income people tend to do. Well, we're, we're, I will say it again without contradiction, we are $14 trillion in debt. So I would beg to differ that the programs are going swimmingly or we would not be on the precipice um, uh, of a financial slew of despond that we may not get out of. With specific reference to the Commerce Clause, can you tell me whether or not you think the Federal Government does not have the authority to send Medicaid back to the States? Um, I am not sure I understand the question. Can Congress send the Medicaid program back to the States? The States already administer the Medicaid program. No, I mean block grant, the very part of Representative Ryan's budget that you just criticized, the block granting of Medicaid monies back to the State. Do we have the authority to do that? I haven't examined the legal authority for that. So you don't challenge that we do have the authority to do that? I do not challenge that. I have not looked at the legal authority. Uh, what plans have you put forth to, to eliminate waste, fraud and abuse in Medicare and Medicaid? I think it is very important to make sure that both of those programs run as effectively and efficiently as they can. I think we need to make sure, and in fact it is our responsibility as a nation to make sure that Federal dollars as well as State dollars spent on health care are actually going to pay for health care for the people they are designed to serve. Well, I, you and I are in agreement on that. My, my question was, what specific plans have you put forth to reform Medicare or Medicaid? I have not. Mr. Cannon. Uh, if you 
could do three things with respect to Medicare. By the end of April, uh, to cut costs, what, what are the first three things you would do? Mr. Chairman, I would give each, uh, I would take the existing Medicare budget and, and convert it into a fixed voucher that each senior would receive to purchase health insurance, a health ins private health insurance plan of their choice, adjusting those vouchers for income and risk, as I mentioned before. That is number one. Now, when you say voucher, in a, in a voucher model, the money goes to the patient. It would it be very much like cash but it would be restricted to health care expenses. They could use it to purchase uh, a health insurance plan, and whatever they don't spend, they would get to keep and even pass on to their heirs, which gives seniors an incentive to weed out waste, fraud, and abuse that just doesn't exist in the program today. Would you have copays for any of the patients under Medicaid? Any uh, disincentive to go to the physician whenever you want to for whatever you want to? In Medicaid? In Medicaid. I, what I would do with Medicaid is block grant the program and give the States maximum flexibility to spend that money on providing medical care to the needy and let them decide whether to use copayments or not. A lot of folks on Medicaid, a copayment is going to keep them away from life-saving care. It, it could. It could. Uh, that, 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 is, that is a fees that could happen. Um, what I, the reason I don't want to be making those decisions is because I don't think I have the wisdom to make those decisions. But the reason that I want block grants is because I think that the States are going to do a much better job of coming up with innovative ways of structuring those benefits so that they provide care to the people who are, who are needy, who are truly needy, and they don't induce people to become dependent on government for their health care as the current Medicaid program does. The, federal, the way the Federal Government pays for Medicaid by matching State funds creates a pay for dependence incentive. If you spend another dollar, that gets someone um, a, for every dollar a state spends, they get one dollar, two dollars, three, in some cases, four dollars from the Federal Government. They can quintuple their money. That encourages states to make people more dependent on the government for their health care. So that is the motivation behind block grants. It would also reduce waste, fraud and abuse in that program because the state would bear the full cost of waste, fraud and abuse as opposed to right now where they only bear 43 percent of the cost on average. All right. Thank you, Mr. Cannon. I will uh, call on the gentleman from Arizona for a second round of questioning, Dr. Gozar. You know, part of the, um, Mr. Cannon, part of the problem that we find is um, for physicians, and particularly in costs associated and why we are having problems, is basically cost shifting, because we have so many physicians um, or so many services that are not compensated for in an unfunded un mandate, so they are constantly shifted. How do you see um, um, how do I want to put this? How do you see the insurance companies be a part of a problem in the tort reform aspect? Because most of the physicians are part of panels. So there are certain things that um, insurance companies will tell the physician or the patient they can or cannot do. It puts uh, physicians in harm's way. I'm, I'm not sure I am aware of any ways that the insurance companies are uh, creating a problem uh, in, in the tort system. Medical malpractice liability insurers actually do a lot uh, of good communicating the signals that the tort system uh, creates uh, into quality improvement me measures to help uh, physicians improve the quality of care that they provide. I understand. But certain procedures, let's say somebody comes in and, and they are going to do an MRI, and the insurance company, you have to pre, you have to pre, um, uh, pre, -authorization. pre authorization to get that done. And maybe it doesn't happen. Who is put in harm's way when that doesn't occur and we have a litigation? Uh, if, you know, if the insurance company requires preauthorization before necessary care um, then, uh, and, and they don't get that preauthorization, the care isn't delivered, well, then that can put the patient in, in jeopardy. If it is that clear cut a case, however, then the insurance company isn't really preventing the provider from uh, providing those services. They are just saying we are not going to pay for it. And, then, and so there is an option for the but provider to provide been, those services. And then but hasn't that been part of the problem, particularly in hospitals and emergency rooms and some of the cost shifting aspects within tort reform? That has been a big question mark as to who is saddled with that, that jurisdiction. I'm not who's going to get the, who's going to get the claim? It is obviously not the insurance company, it is the doc. In these disputes, whenever you have uh, an insurance company and the provider that are not part of the same entity, you are going to end up with these sorts of disputes. 
And I don't really know what is the best way to resolve those disputes. What I know is that we need more experimentation and competition, and we need to let people choose different ways of structuring the financing and delivery of health care so that they can pick whatever way works best for them. There are some health plans where the insurance plan and the, uh, and the providers are essentially part of the same entity. There is still friction there, but a lot less friction than when you just have the insurance company paying the bills. So I don't have a magic bullet solution to that other than choice and competition, which will uh, uh, f let people find a solution that works best for them. So an increased competi competitive marketplace would definitely help us. And, and I think that the, uh, the Chairman Ryan's uh, proposal is a step in that direction. Would it also not have some competition within the insurance industry? Absolutely. That's, that's to be desired. And isn't that a problem for the States right now in most cases? Too much competition? Not enough insurers? competition for States and, oh, and not having the absolutely. jurisdiction over them now. Uh, I, I'm not sure about the jurisdictional issue. However, I think that uh, within each State there is far less competition than there uh, could and probably should be in health insurance, if only because each State prevents their residents from purchasing health insurance licensed by another State. I think that that is an idea that has been, uh, that tearing down those barriers to trade is an idea that has been advanced in, uh, here on Capitol Hill. Certainly we at the Cato Institute have endorsed it, and I think that would dramatically increase competition, um, probably even more than Chairman Ryan's proposal would. So maybe even um, utilizing the Federal Government to actually instill that, for example, uh, having the FTC look in and collusionary and monopoly type rules. I am I'm, I'm more skeptical of uh, antitrust laws, than, although not a, I am not an expert in that area. I am more skeptical of them than I am of Congress's ability to use the uh, Commerce Clause of the Constitution to tear down barriers to trade between the States, which was the original uh, intent of, of, the, of the original meaning of the Commerce Clause. It was uh, intended to allow uh, to create a free trade zone within the United States. We don't have that in health insurance right now, and competition suffers as a result. Mr. Brodsko, do you see competition being a problem in Arizona? Uh, thank you for the question, sir. I, I don't really think that I am equipped to answer that question. The IG's office tries to stay out of those types of things. The competition would definitely help you as far as, as taking your dollar farther, right? Yes, I believe it would. Thank you. Uh, the Chair would recognize the uh, gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Mr. Cannon, help me with this. If you have got 100 people, seniors, who are all sick, who all have preexisting conditions, and you are going to give them a maximum of $15,000 for insurance policy, help me understand how that works. In other words, who is going to insure a senior who is sick? I am just I'm curious. I, I, maybe I am missing something. My understanding, uh, Congressman, is that the $15,000 amount that's, a, would, that's like a max, average. right? I think, uh, my understanding is that would be an average. Right now, I think Medicare uh, spends something like uh, $10,000 or close to that on average per enrollee. And uh, Mr. Ryan's proposal would take today's average amount, let that grow over time, and I think GDP plus 1 percent until 2021, at which point uh, that would be the average voucher amount that seniors would receive, or I'm sorry, premium assistance amount that seniors would receive. And they would, would go receive. out and they would purchase well, this insurance. Let's say that's $15,000. I sort of suspect it would be more. That would then be adjusted for income so that low-income people would get more than $15,000, mm -hmm. adjusted for illness so that if you are low income and sick, you would get even more. Do you know what the max would be? I am not aware of what the maximum would be. That would, that would be a result of the rules, the, the specific right. risk adjustment rules that haven't been spelled out in his budget. But you would have sick people getting a lot more money. Mm -hmm. the, the key is that they would own that money. It would be theirs. If they spent it wisely, then they would get to keep it to help pay for their out-of-pocket expenses uh, in, in, in future years. And if they have some left over when they die, they could pass that on to their children. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it concern you? I know you are concerned about the health of our seniors, right? Absolutely. And I'm, I'm very closely related to two Medicare enrollees. Yeah. So I'm trying to At figure. Least. Now let me let me let me break this down to my district, because I have to be concerned about them. Um, a lot of the people in my district are your sicker population. In other words, it would not shock me if they if I had a room of 50 seniors that perhaps at least out of the 50, 10 might spend some time in a hospital with dealing with maybe perhaps a chronic disease or some emergency situation like heart 
problems or whatever, and those expenses could escalate very rapidly. I mean, and I guess what I'm trying to figure out is I know insurance companies are out there to make money. They make their money. They are going to find a way to make the money. And I'm trying to make sure I understand uh, when they take that piece of paper, I know you don't want to use voucher, but that's basically what it is. No, I don't mind that term. Yeah. They take the voucher and they are shopping around for these insurance companies. They get, assuming they can get one. So you have confidence that these insurance companies are going to insure them. And, well, and, and when we do away with preexisting conditions as a, uh, an element that is, you know, they, the, my, my friends on the other side are saying they want to do away with the Affordable Care Act. One of the main things that my constituents are most concerned about is preexisting conditions. So, and, and as I tell my constituents, you know, some of the younger folks say to me, well, Cummings, I'm not worried about preexisting conditions. I tell them, you just keep on living. You will have some preexisting conditions. So if I got a person who does not have the protection of preexisting conditions, got a voucher, and I'm just wondering, do you, is there a concern that they may not be able to get insurance? Within the context of uh, the Chairman's budget proposal, mm -hmm. Chairman Ryan's budget, um, I'm sorry, Medicare reforms, no. I believe that he would require insurance companies to take all comers. Now, the, what we call these uh, bans on discrimination against people with pre existing conditions, they are really a government price control. A competitive marketplace would set the price for uh, the, the uh, health insurance for someone who is very sick uh, at a very high level, maybe prohibitively expensive for, for that individual. When the government says that you can charge them no more than you charge a healthy person, well, then that insurance company has to charge all enrollees a weighted average. The government is forcing down the price uh, for sick people by forcing up the price. For I got people. that. And, could, and, so, and, and I guess what? Control. So, so the problem with, with government price controls is that they can change the prices that uh, people offer in the marketplace, but they don't change the underlying economic reality that drives those market prices. And so what happens is you have insurance companies trying to mistreat, avoid, and dump sick people as a result of these government price controls. If a patient costs $50,000 to insure, but the government says you can only charge them $10,000, well, an insurance company is going to have to get rid of those sick people by providing them lousy coverage, lousy service, or else they are going to go out of business. And research by President Obama's, uh, some of President Obama's economic advisors have, has, has shown that that is what happens under those government price controls. I would rather do without them precisely because I think we would have better uh, protection for people with very expensive illnesses. I see my time has expired. Mr. Botsko, uh, the first panel uh, talked a little bit about um, this pay first, verify second, third, fourth, recapture if we think we paid out incorrectly, which seems like a very inefficient model. Uh, propose a better model to us, maybe one with verification or investigation on the front end. Well, I am proud to say that the State of Arizona uh, actually does that. We have the Fraud Prevention Unit. That unit is staffed by a group of investigators who go out upon referrals uh, that originate from hospitals due to fraud indicators that uh, the Office of Inspector General has set forth. Once that referral is received by my, my office, the investigators are out on the street within 24 hours uh, conducting interviews. So we stop the people from getting into the system, those that are ineligible and that the investigation has shown are ineligible. And we stop it right at the very beginning. And I believe last year it was about $1.9 million in cost avoidance per investigator. Uh, you have a background in law enforcement? I do. Uh, how many years did you serve in law enforcement? 22 years in Federal law enforcement. With the Bureau? No, I was with the U.S. Department of Defense uh, during, doing contract fraud and also with the U.S. State Department Diplomatic Security Service. Did you ever run an NCIC background check? Yes, sir. Those aren't hard, are they? No, sir. I mean, of seconds. Right. Is it too much to ask that we run a background check or a NCIC on people who purport or want to be durable medical equipment suppliers? Absolutely not. And in fact, uh, the Arizona Office of Inspector General, uh, we are a criminal justice agency. 
So we have an NCIC terminal, and we do those checks. Did you ever do something as outlandish as actually go interview a target or a suspect? All the time, sir. Do you think it is too much to ask that we would go have a field interview with someone who aspires to be a supplier of durable medical equipment to make sure that they have an office and it is staffed and it is something other than a pizza parlor or a post office box? That would certainly be a, a very proper and appropriate uh, means of attack on the program uh, to stop those that are perpetrating fraud. However, as with other, everything, uh, more money, more staff are necessary to do those things. Perhaps. Or perhaps we go to uh, Ms. McQuarrie and are there, um, is there technology that can help, not, not to eliminate any investigator's jobs, but is there technology that can help? And, uh, and let me just add that we actually use one of their products. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um, regardless of, of how health care is paid for, there is going to be fraud in it. And it is critically important to continue the fight against fraud, first in a prepayment mode, as you have um, just indicated, Chairman. And there are technologies available. The clear product that we had in our written testimony and in um, my verbal testimony does a complete research check of all individuals um, for whom we mine the data for. And that would be all of those DME suppliers who want to get into the program. We take that a step further, however, and we can link the risk indicators within this public record data, things like criminal records or pre-existing tax liens or sanctions in one state and the providers move to another state and the state doesn't know that they were sanctioned someplace else. We can link all of that to historic claims data and do predictive modeling and actually assign a risk indicator. This is work that we do today. Assign a risk indicator on those who would be providing applications to get into the program. So if we did have some limited uh, field investigative staff, we would have them go out against those who had the highest risk indicators as opposed to just every tenth supplier who might submit an application for enrollment. Now, Mr. Cannon, uh, quickly, uh, Ms. McQuarrie suggested that you are going to have fraud uh, regardless, uh, which is probably true. Do you have any statistics or perspective on whether or not fraud is more pervasive in the private insurance market or in the government? health care delivery system? You are going to have fraud, I think, wherever you have human beings. But I think you are going to have more fraud in government health care programs than you are in the private sector for the simple reason that government, government is people spending other people's money, and nobody spends other people's money as wisely or as carefully as they spend their own. So we have heard some discussion about tightening provider enrollment in Medicare. You, we could do that. We could also insist that providers provide more documentation with the claims that they file so that we can ensure that those are valid claims. But when you, Congressman, hear from people in your district, providers in your district, that these measures that they have to, they, the legitimate providers have to comply with now are too onerous and can't we repeal them, you and other members of Congress are going to say maybe we should repeal these things. They would prevent fraud. But you will roll them back. Why? Because it is not your mo money that is being lost to fraud. That is how government operates. That is why f waste, fraud, and abuse are endemic to government programs, because government is people spending other people's money. On that happy note, we will end. I want to thank uh, all four of our witnesses and everyone else in the audience for uh, participating, as well as my uh, colleagues on both sides. Thank you.